So I've been tasked with talking about how understanding how reservoirs persist, which kind of unfortunately gives me the task of talking about a lot of, of science. Um, but I think we can do it, and you guys will help me to know that we're doing it together and not just me up here talking. So how does HIV persist in the body? We're going to reiterate some of the themes and then focus in on the ones that I'm going to talk about. So specifically, I'm going to talk about latency. So latency is what was just beautifully introduced by both Dr. Johnson and Dr. Cannon. So this is that sleeping state. So when HIV infects a cell, it actually becomes a part of the DNA. And one key point is that this is different from other viruses. The flu virus doesn't do this. The cold virus doesn't do this. Most GI bugs, you get them and then you get rid of them. The problem with HIV is that in the cells that it gets into, it also integrates itself into the DNA and becomes actually a part of the DNA in the body. So in a portion of the cells that are infected, it'll make proteins and new viruses, and these new viruses can go out and infect other cells, and that's what we call a productive infection or an actively infected cell. This cell oftentimes is going to die. Its machinery that it usually uses for its own proteins is being hijacked by HIV, and so eventually it gets exhausted and it dies. So that's one way that we lose these productively infected cells. The sleeping cell is a different problem. When there's no HIV being produced, the cell can go on its merry way, make its regular proteins, it's not exhausted. If it's a long-lived cell by its nature, it can stay for years and years. And the whole time, it has this sleeping beauty or ticking time bomb, depending on how you want to look at it, of HIV that's just silently there. The other problem is that if it's not making any HIV parts, there's no way the immune system can see it, because how would it know that it's there? So, and then the problem is that the something wakes it up. So if it stayed like that permanently, fine. And actually, if we can find a way to make it stay like that permanently, that would work too. But it doesn't all the time. A change in the environment, a stimulation of the cell that activates it, or a random chance can lead to expression of the HIV genetic material, and then you get viruses. And these viruses go out in the blood and infect new cells. So to achieve a cure, we need to understand how it is that HIV stays quiet. So how does it get into the sleeping state? So now is when we get a little bit uh, sciencey, but I think we can do it. So to take a step back, when HIV is part of our DNA, it's essentially like our genes. And so one way to think about this is how are genes regulated? We all know that everyone has an, a unique DNA sequence, correct? Each one of us is different. And we'll remind you that we're probably close to 99% the same as the person next to us, even though we don't look like that. So clearly, the sequence itself isn't the only answer. There's a lot of regulation that happens on top of that. So DNA is organized into genes, and these genes are, are sequences of DNA. These DNA sequences are coiled up into chromosomes, and then we all have a chromosomal complement that makes us gives us this, this basic blueprint. But then, in any individual, not every gene that you carry is expressed. So we know this from, if you know any identical twins, even if they look alike, they do a lot of things alike, there are differences. They're not exactly the same. And so how we determine which gene is expressed is through a bunch of what we call molecular switches. So these are proteins and other factors that bind to the DNA and turn a gene on or turn it off. So that's what happens with normal genes. So what happens with HIV? So this is a major area of active research. and. A lot of the compounds that Dr. Cannon was talking about that Dr. Karn is screening are looking for ways to turn on these molecular switches or permanently turn them off. And there's a ton of research that's been funded by AMFAR that's really made a huge difference in this area. And as uh, Dr. Johnston put up this slide, I am also not going to go through all these different factors, but clearly there's many, many different signals that are incorporated here. And this is an extremely important area of research and one that I'm actually quite interested in. But the project I'm going to talk to you about today looks at something slightly different. So in addition to looking strictly at these molecular switches, I'm both a researcher and a clinician, so I take care of patients. And I know that if you give the same drug to two different patients, it won't necessarily act in the same way. And so what controls that? There's lots of different factors, the metabolism of the patient, but also the environment of the patient itself. So how are the hormones affecting the gene expression in that patient? And, you know, when it comes down to it, the only genetic difference between men and women is an X and a Y chromosome, right? Y chromosome only has 50 to 60 genes. There are 20,000 genes in the human body. Clearly, those genes make a big difference. But on top of that is also all the hormones that are different between men and women. We're going to talk about some of the more larger differences, not just those molecular switches.
So what are some of these things we can think about? So environmental influences. So in this is just a normal cell with its normal genes. So what controls it? So cigarette smoking, for example, can activate a different program of genes in people. Exposure to sunlight can activate different proteins in skin cells, lead to development of melanoma. Lots of things in the environment, what you eat, what other drugs you're exposed to, can all affect gene expression. Other infections, uh, cytomegalovirus, CMV infection, can affect the gene expression in some of your immune cells. Or every time you see a bacterial infection, it'll trigger some of those molecular switches and turn on a response. And then finally, one of the other things we'll, I'm going to focus on is hormones. So estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, but also stress hormones like cortisol that are secreted when you're in a high-stress environment or when you're sick and your body is stressed in that way. So all of these things we know regulate just normal gene expression. And it's not a big jump to think that they would also participate in the regulation of when HIV is expressed. And so that's what the focus of this project is. This kind of research is a bit messy. Um, looking at hormones is a, a messy area, and it requires actually the kind of collaborative efforts that are, are really one of the amazing things about the ARCH program, because it allows people to come together who can build the cohorts of patients to look at these questions, who can do the molecular work, who can look at the environment and the hormones, and then together you can create a complete picture instead of having each person work on their own, which would not have anywhere near the same amount of power. So the collaborative project that, that I'm a part of is looking at the impact of sex-based differences, and that in this setting, meaning males and females, on HIV reservoir size and immune activation, and gender-specific differences affecting the reactivation of HIV. This is a multi-institution effort, and I'll come to what each of those institutions are doing sort of as I, once I convince you that this is an important project to do. So that's my first step, you know, why, why should we care? And I think the fundamental question is, are there female latent cells and male latent cells, or are they equal? And I think either one of those answers is actually very relevant, and I'll, I'll explain why. And I'm going to take you through three reasons. One, biological differences in HIV infection and immune response. Two, the worldwide burden of infection and how it's different in men and women. And then the clinical trial representation of women in uh, studies of cure. So sex-based differences. So the X's and Y's of immune responses to viral vaccines is a, a great paper that was written about how men and women differ in their responses to a lot of different vaccines. And vaccines are nice because they're very clean. We can say, okay, you've never had this infection. I'm going to give you a vaccine and see what your immune response is to it. If you get an infection, I don't know exactly when you got it. I don't know if you got the most virulent strain. I don't know if you were already tired and, and had some other reason to get a worse infection. Vaccines are a little bit cleaner, so it, it helps us to really get at some of these questions of, of how the response differs. So we've seen differences in responses to influenza, hepatitis A, hepatitis B, dengue, the measles, mumps, rubella. And when we do a genetic study, which again, I'm not going to spend any time, but I'm just going to call your attention to this pie chart. So we looked at the genes that are induced by a vaccine. There are over 600 genes induced in women. Those are the pink ones. There are four, well, 67 genes induced in men. The blue ones are the four that are only in men. And then there are only 63 that are the same between men and women in their response to the yellow fever vaccine. This would argue that actually there's a big difference in how men and women respond to the same thing, to the same vaccine, and that it's important for us to figure out what those differences are. So, okay, vaccines, but can I convince you that it also happens in actual infections? Now, as a doctor, I can tell you that, you know, there are certain diseases that we know that show up in women more than men, things like lupus, or that act differently in women versus men, even things like heart disease. If we look at shingles incidence, hepatitis E, which is known to cause a very serious infection in pregnancy when usually in non-pregnant women or in men, they do fine. Hepatitis C, which there's some early data to suggest there's a difference in men and women depending on their IL-28B genotype. And now is there a male-female difference in HIV. So I think that there is a strong suggestion that there is. We know that when people are not treated, so viremic infection, that women generally have lower viral loads. But that doesn't protect them. They still progress at the same speed as men. They have higher levels of immune activation when we look at their T cells in response to a virus. So if you only have 5,000 copies of virus in a woman, her T cells will look like they're seeing 50,000 in a man. In terms of cure studies, there's some early suggestions, and those I've sort of outlined here. There's a lower level of HIV DNA in cells from HIV, in, in HIV infected women who are suppressed. 
there may be a higher incidence of that post-treatment control. So when people stop therapy, do they continue to control the virus or not? And there may be a longer time for the virus to come back. So all of these things suggest that HIV might actually be different. And why would there be a difference? I'm just going to give you some of the scientific reasons why this is compelling. So the X chromosome, it encodes TLR7, which is one of the innate immune system's most important receptors for identifying viral infections. So women will have two copies, men will have one. It won't always be, ex it doesn't exactly work quite that simply in terms of gene dosage effect, but it is certainly a, a one way in which they, they may, uh, men and women may differ. In terms of interferon, so I'm sure you've heard about interferon therapy for hepatitis C, hopefully moving out of, of use because it's so difficult to take. But the body actually produces its own interferon. It's a natural antiviral uh, cytokine, as we call it. And if you look at male and female responses, the interferon induction is, is actually quite different in to the same stimulation. Likewise, as I've already mentioned, hormones, so just to touch on a few, so estrogen and progesterone. So there's something called uh, progesterone-induced binding, uh, binding inhibitory factor and that actually directly affects T cells and decreases their function. Why would women have that? Well, again, it comes back to the idea of pregnancy, where if you are pregnant and you attack the baby, that would not be a successful outcome. So during pregnancy, you need to actually suppress your own immune system so that you tolerate the presence of the baby. That's one of the biological reasons why there actually has to be immune differences between a man and women. And that same thing actually applies to natural killer cells, which are a new, well, they're not new, but they're a newly interesting area, a cell for the immune system that has become a focus of a lot of research in terms of HIV cure. There's also several socio-behavioral differences, which I'm not going to touch on too much, but I think it's always important to acknowledge that men and women are not the same, and in lots of different ways. That it's hard when the research always comes down to something that's like totally an obvious question, or an obvious statement, right? But um, I think the, the crucial thing is we need to define how that is and actually see if there are ways that understanding those differences could help us find cure for all people. And I'll sort of, both men and women, I'll come to that at, at the end. <laughs> so why would this be significant? And I think this is when we need to think about the worldwide burden of infection. So women account for more than half of people living with HIV in low and middle income countries. In Sub-Saharan Africa, where there's 24.8 million people living with HIV, 58% of them are women. In particular, young women and girls are likely to be infected, and they're the 60% of the new infections between the ages of 15 and 24. So not only does that mean that they're getting infected young, but it means that they will be around for a long time. And I think that one of the great things about AMFAR is that the vision is for a cure that's worldwide, and we need to really be able to bring cure to all of the people for whom it's relevant, and not just the people in the developed world or the people that are right in front of us. We need to think about all the people who will need to benefit from this cure. So women are also less likely to be enrolled in cure studies and in any clinical trials, and I've experienced that in my own clinic population, and I think there are a number of reasons behaviorally, which I could say anecdotally, but I don't have a lot of evidence to support. But in specifically looking at clinical trials, Dr. Johnson actually wrote a really wonderful review of this, and 2,300 out of 12,000, or close to 13,000, patients in CURE trials were women. That's only 17.9 percent. Twenty-six percent of all studies actually excluded women, so they weren't even involved in the studies. And fewer than one percent of the women who were in CURE studies took part in the reactivation trials that have been so um, much in the news recently with the HDAC inhibitors and SAHA, or in the cell therapy. So they're, they're not participating in the ones that are the most cutting edge. And I think it's really critical to know whether or not these strategies will be relevant for them or not. So now I'm just going to come to what the actual project is, and th then maybe we can talk about some, see if anyone has questions. So it's a collaboration across uh, four institutions. So the Reagan Institute up at Harvard, uh, where we're doing some immune studies, Case Western Reserve, UCSF, and the VGTI. So what is everybody doing? So at UCSF, they, are, um, they have what's known as the SCOPE cohort, which has been a fantastic data source for many years, looking at a lot of different immune indicators and the response to many different interventions. So they are, have a fantastic infrastructure, and they're using that to recruit a large cohort of men and women. All of these men and women will have their viral loads fully suppressed for at least one year, and all of the women are going to be of reproductive age and not on exogenous hormones. And we have these jokes when we talk about it, how we need HIV-infected nuns, because 
having <laughs> women who are of reproductive age who are not taking hormonal contraception or Depo-Provera or any of those things, is, it becomes a little challenge. But, but we're doing our best. And as I said, these kinds of studies are messy. But if you don't like get into the messiness, you won't find the answers. So that's what we're really trying to do. We have an extensive reproductive history questionnaire that will give us a lot of data about the hormone exposure. We're going to, and then we're doing comprehensive clinical data collection, and then a lot of immune profiling using flow cytometry and very highly sensitive clinical measures of viral load. And this is the team out there: uh, Dr. Deeks, who you'll hear from later, as well as Monica Gandhi, Peter Bacchetti, our reproductive expert, and the fantastic team of the Scope um, Clinical Trials Center. And then. At the VGTI, the Vaccine and Gene Therapy Institute in Florida, Nicolas Chaumont has been doing our very sensitive uh, measures of viral reservoir. So he's developed some new assays. He's one of the groundbreaking scientists in this area to look at whether or not HIV is there, whether or not HIV is capable of being produced. And so the samples, once they're collected in San Francisco, are going to go to these different locations for these advanced studies, and, and that's what they'll be doing in Florida when the cells get to Florida, not getting a tan. Um, so what we're doing up in Boston, we're looking at the innate immune profile, and that'll be partially by flow cytometry, partially by measurements in plasma. We're going to measure the hormone levels so we can correlate them or look and see if there's a relationship with any of the other measures that we're doing. And then we're using the uh, collaboration with the Broad Institute, which does uh, highly advanced genetic studies, to look at the expression of all the genes in their blood, and particularly to follow the interferon pathways that I mentioned already are different in men and women. And then uh, the prince raises his head again, and uh, Jonathan Karn at Case Western Reserve. And so he, in this case, is going to use the reactivators from his panel to see that our um, have relationships to hormones. So he's sh shown in some preliminary studies that something like tamoxifen, which is, as you may know it, is a therapy for breast cancer and acts on hormone receptors, can actually interact with HIV and affect whether or not it becomes expressed. So he's using the panel of reactivators that he had that's related to these questions to look at our samples in men and women. And then he's also going to look at other reactivators that have nothing to do with hormones and see if they differently, differentially affect cells from men and women to get at this question of whether or not women, there really are pink and blue latent cells or if they're all purple or green. Um, and so that's what's going to be done there. And for that, we're using leukapheresis samples, so these high-volume white blood cell collections, which um, we're enrolling a small subset of patients to do those studies in as well. And so at the end of this, what we hope to have is really a comprehensive comparison of fully suppressed men and women. We'll have sensitive measures of reservoir. We'll have extensive data about immune activation. We'll have data about the response to reactivation agents, both specific hormone responsive elements, and then just looking at the comparison of the non-hormone related ones in men and women. And then hopefully these data will answer the question of how sex is relevant to latency in HIV and what the implications are for cure strategies. And I really hope we'll provide the rational basis for inclusion of women in clinical trials. And again, part of that is because if we know how to account for any differences, then we can balance them or we can you know, consider any data generated in the light of whether there were men or women in the studies. And we can more aggressively recruit women to participate in them if there are differences that could be relevant for both populations. So what I've hoped to convince you is that latency is a barrier to cure, which I think is going to be a common theme throughout everyone's talk here today, that there are multiple layers that regulate HIV expression just in the way that there are multiple layers of regulating all of our gene expression, that cure strategies need to be clinically relevant for all patients, uh, including both men and women. And this is just one example. I think there are a lot of other ways to think about this particular problem of how the things we develop in the test tube need to work in the clinic. And that collaborative research is really critical to answer these questions because no individual center has both the most advanced methods in the molecular work and the best clinical infrastructure and the best molecular work or pharmacologic work in the other areas that we're looking at. And that the global burden of infection really makes this research essential. And so we can't, as researchers, we can't thank you enough for your investment in trying to answer these questions with us.